It's a special pleasure for me to, to introduce uh, Paloma Diaz uh, today. Um, welcome, Paloma. Welcome to the Kelo Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, Paloma uh, Diaz Lobos is, um, is the associate director of the Lila Frenson um, Center for Latin American Studies and Collection at the University of Texas, Austin. No doubt, one of the best places to study Latin America in the country and in the world. Um, um, I, I, in, in addition, Paloma, and this is the way I, I we met her. Um, in addition, Paloma works for the Latin American Studies Association, handling all the um, social networks of Plaza, which is really a crazy amount of work because Plaza has all so the accounts for Plaza for Latin American Studies Association all the accounts for the LASA Congress, the accounts for all the sections of the Latin American Studies Association, and the accounts for the, the accounts for the Latin American Research Review, which are, of course, crucial for me. And, and Paloma has done an, an amazing work in terms of disseminating the research that we publish at the Latin American um, research, research Review. So a couple of years ago, at, at one of the LASA Congresses, LAR organized a workshop on how to use the social networks to disseminate research, um, our research, and how to how to present our research online. And Paloma did a wonderful job at this presentation. So I'm, I'm really, really happy that now we have the opportunity to have Paloma here with us. And I think that there is, it's hard for me to imagine a better way to kick off our Graduate Student Appreciation Week than having Paloma present today. So thank you very much, and, and thanks for all grad students for being here. Thank you, Paloma. Thank you so much for hosting this event. Uh, my name is Paloma Diaz. I'm from Chile, and I have worked in government and nonprofit and academic academia for the last 20, 20 years. And of course, I grew up in that pre social media world, so I can very like most people in my generation to this. Uh, and I want to, uh, today, I want to discuss how we can think more strategically about the use of social media and networks to promote your research and your publications. And if any of you right now is thinking, wow, I don't recognize some of those items. <laughs> you are not wrong. I don't recognize many of these things. In fact, the truth is I'm not a social media expert. It will be an endless chase to try to keep up with all the platforms that keep coming. I focus on those where most of the key networks are for us. In my case, it's Latin American studies, so it's mostly about Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And today I'm going to be talking mostly about those. Uh, we will need a whole separate talk just to talk about research data and academia data, which this will not be the focus of this talk for today. So before uh, going into detail, let me tell you a little bit of the history of how social media came and changed the world of academia. I will say that academia came late to the game. First were corporations, then celebrities, and then academia started realizing that this could be useful for our work. And there was resistance at the beginning. I remember a story in which I had to push to create the first fake Facebook account for our institute. And I remember taking pictures like we normally do of our conference and the reception, and the dancing part with the part of the reception. And we post all that on Facebook. And there was a whole meeting next day to discuss is really the fun place we want to give to the world, faculty dancing, that's very inappropriate. <laughs> so if we have a hard time in sharing with the world, some of the activities that happen in academia. And the truth is, academia is a very hierarchical institution. Knowledge is produced mm -hmm. top to bottom, uh, it's very formal, there's emphasis in planning and crafting things very carefully, which mm -hmm. social media has a very different approach. We change the game. Things happen immediately. And reactions to instant reactions to things happening may go viral while something maybe that prepared for a full year to publish, maybe not even pay attention. Mm -hmm. So it was hard for academia to decide that this is something that could benefit us. It took a long time. And when they finally decided, okay, let's embrace this, they realized they didn't have experts. They people who start going to workshops for social media and academia have to go to this class taught by people who came from corporations, where they will tell you, this is how you buy followers, this is the marketing strategy, the 
this is how you sell your product. And we will look at each other and we start to like, these people do not get this. They have no idea what first of all is happening. So eventually more and more people start, start understanding how social media interact with the academic world. And today, uh, institutions use it to promote scholarly work of faculty and students. They use it to promote the recruitment of uh, faculty and students too. They use it to increase awareness about their programs, uh, drive traffic to the websites. In fact, in many places, websites are becoming basically online brochures. They don't change very much. It takes longer to update information there. So people tend to go to social media when information is updated frequently. Uh, they use it to drive traffic to their websites, to attract private donors, and of course, to develop this sense of belonging and community. And I come from UT Austin, and I think we have something in common with Notre Dame when it comes to belonging and sense of community. Do you know what could be? A single place and we are all having a sense of belonging. <laughs> and social media is great to try to get people excited about the use of the web of course, fundraising is the best step of mine. And social media has been key in helping universities expand, and it's really hard to find a university now that do not have some sort of social media presence. So now the university all embrace it. Academics too, of course. Now academics, let me go back, have used it from the very beginning, of course, for personal reasons, to stay in touch with high school classmates, with your parents, etc. But using it as an academic tool came years later. And today, academics can become public intellectuals through social media. Uh, I have some data here. I'm not sure if you can read it well, but to be honest, I don't work with most of, most of these disciplines. The core of my work is social science and humanities. And when I saw the graphic, it completely matched my perception that people in social science use social media much more as a tool than people in humanities. You will see the green is the faculty, and uh, this, this dark blue is students. So it's the same proportion. Social science, much more. I would say political science are the ones that use the most uh, social media to promote their work. And the blue there, there the cobalt blue that you're there is administration, which means in both cases, it's about the same proportion. Institutions promote their work in a equal amount. But academics itself is more typical social science. Um, so, let me ask you this today. Do you think that right now the chances of publishing a book or article are higher than 20 years ago or not? What do you think? If you have to start publishing your first article or book, do you think you have better chances than someone who did it 20 years ago? Bro, well, you have an opinion about this one you were mentioning. <laughs> Let me put in this spot here. Well, I think it's gotten harder. What? Uh, just more competition, more pressure on the graduates. So more, more, people people yeah, more, people. more people. So the venues may have also grown. We have well, the predatory journals, and you have printed media, and you have now all sorts of online media. You have open access, you have some publishing, you have blogs. But, so there's a lot of there. And it's harder for people to be published, but also for the readers, it's harder to try to distinguish high quality research from everything else that's out there. So, we, by the way, let me put here a commercial. The Latin American Study Association created a new portal to publish books in Latin America. So, it's expensive to publish in Latin America. So, this will be, uh, they will be launching the first book being this year. It's open access, free publication for Latin Americans. So, basically, you have all this information out there, and it's really hard to stand out. It's really hard. So publishers really expect authors to have a stronger role promoting their publication. Of course, they are the one that knows best the networks. So the expectation is there. In fact, I don't know if you remember a few years ago when the email signatures started having, oh, here's the link to my book. When well, you can get something new. And I know many faculty were sent to doing that. They didn't want to promotion. They told us not a job to do that. But it's expected that you do it. And now when you get a contract from the press, they will send you guidelines on how you can do it through social media. So um, I found this uh, tweet two weeks ago. Let me read it to you. Academics worry about self-promotion. As a university press editor, I'm looking specifically for 
authors with a platform, mostly social media. Uh, those willing to talk openly about their research are the best. So the expectation is out there. They may not tell you, but it helps. In fact, that tweet was followed by a number of other tweets, including from another press, someone saying, well, in our case, our press only cares about quality research, nothing else. And it doesn't it tell you, but the expectation is there that you're going to help out with the promotion of this. Uh, today, academics can use social media to enhance your research and collect feedback. And this is not just after publication. In the process of studying, I see more and more academics asking to the public for feedback about databases. I see more people sharing databases, which in the past didn't happen so much. Uh, they use it to collaborate with, join, or build academic networks. And I can tell you later how can you start developing those networks. They use it to share expertise within academia and beyond academia with policymakers, with uh, journalists, uh, think tanks, etc. And they use it to increase the impact of their uh, publications. I read an article that says that uh, highly tweeted uh, articles, publications are 11 times more likely to be cited than others they're not tweeted. So it does matter. And they use it also to enjoy uh, academic world and make fun of the academic world. And this is my, one of my favorite accounts to follow. Have you followed Academic Say? Have you seen it? They mock the academic world. This is one of my favorite tweets from from academia. So uh, <laughs> those are my uh, networks are the new currency. This what matters more than money and other things. And we have to start building those early. I have an internship program for undergrads, and I even tell freshman students, don't wait the month before graduation to start networking. You need to start building those strategically from early on so you won't have them when you need them. The same for, for promoting publications. You may think, well, when I publish my book and they ask me to create a Twitter account, I will go ahead. But it's not going to work if you have no followers. You need to be very strategic and decide now who are those networks that you want them to be part of. I'm going to give you a few tips now. Some of them are very the you will recognize them, but others will be new to you. So let me start on how you create an online profile that's aligned with your academic goals. And here is where I see most difference between Latin American academics and US based academics. Anyone here is a Latin American academic? No one? Everyone is US based? Oh, good. So, one of the differences I see is the way that Latin Americans do, do not connect with institutional affiliation. And it may be because the system is different, they're not tenure, or they have multiple jobs. That's not what the drives their online profile. Uh, U.S. academics most of the time will include I am a professor at university. Latin Americans use a lot of poetic freedom to describe themselves. <laughs> so I'm going to use an example here, and you can tell me what do you think is wrong? It's not the most strategic approach. Do you want other academics to follow you? Can you read that? <laughs> okay. Tell me if you think <laughs> you could improve your academic trying to search for something. <laughs> What problem do you see here? <laughs> First, the picture, of course. I mean, there's in a world where so many bots and fake news and fake accounts, having a professional picture gives you some level of legitimacy so they can recognize that person. So make sure they use a professional picture. Don't use your swimsuit vacation shop. Leave those for Instagram all those things. The name, use the name that you use as author. And if you don't speak Spanish, I'm not sure what's the best way to translate Moses Abroso. I don't know. So don't use those kind of names that you don't want people to, to distrust your legitimacy of the academics. Regarding the username, which is the apps, the Twitter account name, try to go as close as possible as your actual name. And if you happen to be called John Smith or Juan Perez, they don't talk a lot because those names are taken, you will never claim them. But you need to figure out how to create one that looks like your real name. 
Regarding the bio, this is another area where Latin Americans, especially, are way too creative and they don't describe the research work. Here it says in English, uh, and a dreamer, a poet, a free thinker, I hate Mondays, I love my Zeppelin. <laughs> the Starlight Zeppelin is misspelled. That's one problem sometimes you see them, you see them bias. Then uh, all you those doing is I hate Mondays. That's the first thing you want people to know about you. Maybe it's not the smartest thing to say because the same way that books are judged by covers, if you're on Twitter, you will be judged by your profile. So be strategic. And then Latin Americans say all this to me is uh, they define themselves by parenthood or, or marriage. And the husband of Maria Jose and the father of the Pizzi Pepita. I mean, it's great if you want to be used as a reference for parenthood tips. If you're not tweeting about parenthood, leave that out. Use the bio for more strategic information. Let me give examples of three online profiles that work for academic purposes. The first one here, Pedro uh, Calvente from Europe. He used first name, is similar to his actual name. He used his affiliation and he tagged his institution and then he has some keywords about his research. The same with the second person who used uh, the title of her book and a link to the press. And the last person who used affiliation and keywords. And all of them link to their actual bio online, which is a good way to, for people to learn more about you. And the pictures, of course, are very professional pictures. Uh, another uh, things you should consider is to not treat all social media platforms the same. We, many of us make the mistake to make the same post on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I say if you're, most of you, your research is not very image driven. If you work in Bolivian textiles or colonial art from Peru, Instagram is a great platform for you. If you're doing graphs and databases, don't even bother posting Instagram because <laughs> you're not going to attract lots of people there. I, to be honest, I hate Instagram for work purposes. You can now share easily, you can now click links. I mean, I am an old person and I hate posting things on my cell phone. And only you can do it from an iPad or cell phone. I like to do things from the computer. Instagram doesn't offer you those possibilities. But if you want to share the role of your information, Twitter is a way one. Identify who is your key audience. And don't tell me who is everyone, because it's not everyone. I mean, two mayors in Pakistan who are doing engineer research may not connect with you if you're doing democracy in Latin America. You need to think who are the people who want to follow. You may want certain presses to follow you if they, to keep an eye on your research. You may want uh, for instance, universities who may want to offer you a course or uh, certain centers uh, attached to your research, etc. Provide a public service. Most people tend to be very self-centered in social media when indeed you can provide great service to your field. You can identify needs that will enhance the field and for instance, you can promote all the job posts that come in your field. You can offer databases, share databases of your research, of other people's research. You can promote publications coming in your area. And I have here a link to see if it works. It's a uh, hashtag that I created. Let me see if it's here. And it's basically a hashtag where we post all books coming on Latin American studies in the last years. So you can go to the hashtag to see all the books that come in your research time in different fields. So, um, and you can also promote side underrepresented groups in your field. If you're in political science, there's not enough women tweeting about authoritarian regimes, you can recruit them, you can create these, you can direct attention to their work. I have these two here, they're doing a great job, as women also know. Inside black women, they're both growing immensely because they found a big need in the field that is to promote these groups. And then the next slide is mini networks. Uh, imagine that many of you are members or are aware of the large professional academic associations in your field. The one, of course, I know the best is the one I mine is Latin American Studies. Those associations have many networks. I know, for instance, the American Sociological Association have sections. The same with LASA. We have 40 sections, subfields. APSA has sections too. 
you know? Okay. So these are smaller spaces where you can interact more directly with colleagues with similar interests. In the case of LASA, the Latin American Science Associations, we have groups and we have Twitter accounts. And you can join those groups. I manage those groups, so you don't need to be a member, you don't need to be registered in LASA, but if you tell me, actually work on this topic and you give me your affiliation, I will accept you. Then you become part of the group and you can interact and promote publications to ask questions with other scholars. In the case of Twitter, even easier. You just follow those subsections and it's more likely people will pay attention to your tweets in the same field. This is another great resource by Twitter. The links allow you to either subscribe to other organization links or create yours if they're useful in your field. For instance, if you work on migration issues, you can create a list of all the NGOs they are uh, promoting research on the topic if you're working democracy, et cetera, et cetera. This is an example from a group from my association. I have created about 20 links, and some of them may be important for you. There's one for Latin American studies in Europe, one for the libraries in Latin America, uh, for uh, Latin American data. So each of those links will have members, and you can follow them, you can subscribe to their conversations. And you can create your own too. If you think there's going back to the example of women, if there's not enough uh, women tweeting about democracy in Latin America, you can create a list and people will subscribe and will follow. <laughs> so a few tips to maximize the impact of your posts. Label your or the organizations and the yield to work on similar topics. For instance, if I'm going to tweet. Thank you to Kayla for bringing me here. I have to remember to tag Kayla, otherwise it will be disconnected to the conversation. The same with authors. If you're discussing an author, make sure to find them in Twitter and tag them. Research the most common hashtags or keywords in your field. And if you use those keywords, you will join the big virtual dialogue around those topics. Use periodically quotes from your article, your book, and the links to the publication. I mean, you don't want to be the one saying all the time, here's my book, here's my book. You have to find new ways to engage with the audience. And maybe you can go to a chapter and get a quote that may be connected to something happening in the country. It's another way to direct attention to your publications. Pictures. I know I say that your research is not driven by image, it's not going to help very much, but you can add pictures if you go to a conference and you get to see all students take pictures then. If you give a talk, make sure that you take pictures. It's a great way to attract attention of an iteration that's not very good in terms of paying attention to text in general. Interact with other authors in your field. If they post a question, make sure to answer them. When you uh, go and, and ask a question and tag the other person, it's a good way to see how you can be in the same level of discussion with someone you never even met. Post questions, and I love Twitter in that sense, they offers you the possibility of being polls because attract so many people, so easier just to answer by selecting an option. Uh, for instance, if you work in authoritarian regimes, you can post like, <laughs> of these countries, which is the one who had more coups in the last century. Or if you're working in Venezuela, which of these countries is the country that was receiving more Venezuelan immigrants last year? People really are driven to those polls. Even if they don't have any expertise in the matter, everyone wants to be part of these discussions. Keep an eye on trending topics, and whenever possible, do the work in the posts. And I, here I have an example for last week, Gerardo Cadala, which is a Facebook friend I never met, but it's in my network, but he posted this on Twitter too. Last year, I taught a first year seminar in Watergate, anticipating we'll be talking about impeachment for a while, I'm posting the syllabus here. And people love it, and the number of people or the retweet it or use it. And it's a great way to talk to the, share information about how they develop the syllabus. And the, the only thing here is he should have used the keywords impeachment now or whatever is the keyword going on around the future to connect it to those discussions. But that's how you make your teaching and your research relevant. Um, <clears throat> Uh, of course, tweet periodically. Uh, 
don't be monothematic, especially if you're talking about yourself. You know, when you're talking about yourself all the time uh, and connected to that, don't use it just for self promotion. Be generous, promote your colleagues, your students, your institutions. If your university has a brand new diversity program, celebrate it and tag the university and post it there. Follow university presses that focus on their field. You will get great ideas for titles or book cover designs. You will see what are the trending topics and publications, etc. Tweet during conference using the hashtag on the back. And because I manage the account of LASA in the Congress, I have to say that I see a lot of negativity out there. And it happens with most associations. People complain about the cost of membership, the cost of registration, the cost of hotels, there's not, not enough water in the room for the talk. <laughs> so you see so much complaints. And now and then, if you have something positive to say, make sure you tag the organization. If you do it with us, I'm going to retweet you. Because I want to say something else, I'm going to retweet you in your I'm going to get back. So do it with your organization too. <laughs> Identify the most influential authors in your field and learn from them. I'm sure they're uh, have reached a point in which you're able to connect your research and make it relevant for many, many audiences. Branding, of course, use your Twitter account in business cards, um, PowerPoint. It's the first time I'm using my Twitter account in PowerPoint. I'm going to see if it makes a difference or not. If I get one more follower at the end, maybe it works. <laughs> uh, use it in blogs, etc. It's, uh, it, it, even in your classrooms, if you are uh, teaching students, use it there too. So it's a good way to put the account out there. So these are some of the basic tips. Now I'm be very happy to take questions. I will even encourage you further to create a Twitter account and start tweeting your own work and promoting other colleagues. So if you have any questions, let me know. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts about advantages and disadvantages of teaching, of, of tweeting and Oh, that's a great question. Actually, we do it for our association, and I think it's good. You're trying to reach two very different audiences, right? One in Latin America, one in your case, and one here. I think that people who only speak one of them will be put off by half of your tweets, but I think it shows that you are reaching out to much, much more. And the bilingual people will love it. You, you can do it twice if this post is relevant in both languages, do it in different languages in two different tweets. Yeah, I tend to tweet very different things, but I'm always like a little concerned whether people are going to be like, uh, again, again, in a foreign language that I don't understand. It's kind of annoying. No, no, go for it. Go for it. I mean, faculty and students have a freedom of speech that we as staff can have. I mean, uh, my association has some guidelines about how we're not supposed to say this, 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 or that. So on Twitter, I'm very disciplined, and I have so many times I wish you could respond to Trump, but that's not, not going to do it. <laughs> now, on Facebook, I don't care. I do it all the time. But I wish you could have freedom of speech, so enjoy your freedom of speech. Go for it. So I have to admit that I'm kind of shy to be, you know, just promoting myself a lot. Um, and so I was wondering, in the case of LASA, if you have also venues to promote uh, the research or uh, the research that hasn't been published in a, a LASA venue like uh, LAR, uh, but it's on Latin America. I know you have a lot, yeah. I mean, and to be yeah. free to So LAR, LAR is very self-promotional. We only do LAR stuff for LAR. Latin American studies is very broad, and it's not just academic. Sometimes we do things about journalists, op-eds, et cetera. Tagas, and if you post Latin America, we'll be happy to post it and share it with the world. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you, how many of you have Twitter accounts? How like Good. <laughs> and the ones who do not have, have you made your decision to never ever have one? Your computer committed to never do it? Yes. Can I ask you why? So I almost thought one of two things would happen either. I take a lot of time and post a bunch of things and nobody would read it. <laughs> <laughs> or it would become more popular and everybody would read it and it would take even more time. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first argument, you can say that about publishing a book. No more could be a book. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, no, 
be surprised as soon the university starts measuring your service to universities by how you are actively in social media and maybe yeah. they're soon. But I think if you use it to promote your own book, it can only help. Also, I've, I've been told directly by the editor that I was supposed if we were not on Twitter, we were supposed I know they yeah, tell yeah. first authors more often than like more senior people, but she was like, if you're not on Twitter, you need to join Twitter yeah. and let me know what's up. Exactly. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So how often, how much is too much self-promotion? Uh -huh. Should, uh -huh. should yeah. every other post, <coughs> should every other post be self-promotion or every post? Yeah. Yeah. That's a balance. You have mm -hmm. to find a way to compromise. I mean, you don't Impeachment is your research. You can be posting 20 times today on your book right now, and no one will complain because it's connected to the discussion. But you have to find a real balance in which you're promoting your colleagues and students and students. Yeah. Yeah, and how do you manage negativity? Like, I mean, <laughs> you might get because you are self promoting or talking on a controversial yeah. issue most yeah. often. And so now it's such a toxic environment, yeah. depending on. Well, the audience. Avoid picking fights if you can. If you're talking about your research, I assume you're not directly picking a fight with anyone else, but you may get some negativity too. But I mean, that means that people are paying attention to your research, which is <laughs> also important too, right? But I mean, it's not for everyone. Some people who are going to be affected by this kind of discussions online may not enjoy it, may take away like this key. But you have to develop thick skin. But make it worse and put gas into like expression, gas into the fire by picking more fights. But put out there your research is worth it. Any other questions? Graduate student questions. Yes, you are starting your career. This is the time for you to jump on it and start following all the key people and having a presence there. In fact, I was the other day in a park in which we were talking about another colleague from a different university, and someone said, I haven't met this person, but I know all the social media work, so that's amazing. So this is another way for you to make yourself visible <laughs> even before you start publishing. So do it in a smart way. What would you say is the most effective way to boost your number of followers on Twitter? Oh, people will say you can buy followers, don't do it. No, I will say first you have to be generous and follow the accounts that you want to follow. You have to be generous. I mean, some people might say, I want many more people to follow me than follow them. No, follow as many as possible. Be strategic. Identify those networks which you think are, in your case, uh, colleagues you have to political science. Identify all the leaders, people there, and follow them. And then post frequently engaging content that connects political science to other issues. But you know how much it is to be honest, I am not very good in Twitter, in part because I feel very restricted to say many things, so I barely post anything. So, so is there a way to identify who in political science is on Twitter? For instance, if you go to the section of Latin American political institutions, I have a list of Twitter people on Twitter that tweet about Latin American political institutions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Finding the right resources for you. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.